This edition of Incredible Idaho is being brought to you through the combined efforts of the Idaho Fish and Game Department and KTVB Channel 7. Funding for tonight's program is made possible by First Security Bank, Albertsons, Brown Rental, and Southwest Airlines. Sit back and enjoy this unique opportunity to visit our state's wild and scenic places as we bring you Incredible Idaho. Welcome to Incredible Idaho. I'm Wayne Walker, and tonight we begin our show with a journey into the past. In 1803, President Thomas Jefferson paid France a little over $19 a square mile for a huge unexplored area of the American continent called the Louisiana Territory. It was discovered to be exceedingly rugged, mountainous, and wild, but it held the promise of riches for those reckless few who were willing to brave this vast territory to trap for furs. And so the era of the mountain man was born. It was relatively short-lived, beginning somewhere around 1824 and lasting until about 1840. But the romance and legend this period created has generated scores of modern-day trapper rendezvous across the country. For today's mountain men and women, it's an opportunity to revert to the time of the great legends. John Coulter, Jim Bridger, Joe Meek, Hugh Glass, names linked to remarkable tales of high adventure and extreme hardship. I was low, but right on my, Whoa. right on my ball. I, I think in some ways they would, they would scoff at us and say, you guys are not, nothing to what it was really like and you don't understand. And to a certain extent, they would be right. But we play as hard as we can, as close as we can. Mike Murray is the president of the Idaho Muzzleloader Association. But at the rendezvous, he prefers the title bourgeois. It's a French-Canadian term the mountain men used for the boss man, the company representative who purchased the furs from the trappers at the annual rendezvous. Uh, this is where the guys came in and got their resupplied. Company uh, brought in supplies for their own people. Uh, and then uh, other people heard about it, showed up, and started getting uh, their supplies. So it, it just kind of got bigger and bigger and bigger. It developed into a festive social event complete with food, drink, and games of skill. Modern day rendezvous like this one near Idaho City reproduce the atmosphere of the early 1800s. For the more purest of the participants, this means camping the old fashioned way. Come on in. Callus Young, or Sea Dog as he's called here, has been attending rendezvous for 13 years. Sea Dog and his wife prefer camping in a teepee to any other tent or trailer. The smoke from a fire built in the center of the teepee floor will draft out this hole in the top. When it storms, raindrops catch on the poles and shed down their length, leaving the inside of the teepee dry. It's a design that's both practical and homey. For one thing, you can lay in here at night and see the stars. <laughs> uh, they're just more peaceful too, I think. Uh, just more of a, a pleasant aura about them. Everyone in the camp lives primitively. Only teepees like sea dogs or different types of wall tents built from white canvas are allowed. 
Food is prepared over open fires, and even these must be started without the aid of a match or lighter fluid. And then there's three or four ways you can do it. You can use a, you can use a glass, magnifying glass to heat your char cloth, or you can use a flint and steel or a fire bow. And He got 14 seconds. He got 14 seconds. Young Josh is sort of an unofficial timekeeper here at the fire building contest. Just like the 19th century rendezvous, competitions of all types are held throughout the weekend, ranging from scavenger hunts for the littlest mountain men and women to target shooting with primitive weapons. Okay, everybody here? We want, we want safety. Safety first. The firearms are all muzzle loaders, that is rifles and pistols that are capable of being loaded only from the muzzle. It's a time-consuming procedure that's begun by pouring a measure of black powder into the bore. This is followed by a piece of cloth called the patch. The round musket ball is laid on top of the patch and forced into the mouth of the barrel. Then the whole works is hammered down the length of the rifle with a ramrod. That's it. Then you put the cap on it, and up there on the firing line, and you're ready to go for it. That was a hit. Good hit. Imagine the mountain men as they hunted for their game going through this process each time they took a shot. For many of these folks, that's a challenge they look forward to each fall. Idaho has almost 13,000 sportsmen who choose to hunt with muzzle loaders. This will help. Uh, out there uh, when you're out there hunting because you get a better idea of just exactly where your rifle's shooting and instead of your uh, offhand with 90 percent of your hunting will be offhand and it uh, it helps you get uh, a steady arm to be able to go out and hit an animal and, and, and bring it down. Part of the challenge in hunting with a primitive weapon is stalking the animal. A skilled hunter is only accurate within 125 yards with a muzzle loader, and most prefer to be closer to assure a kill and avoid just wounding the animal. It's a challenge, it's a heritage, uh, and it's all of the above, if, if that's any answer for you. To be able to stalk an animal, to get within uh, 40 to, uh, to uh, 50 yards, which is my preferred range, and, and to be able to take that animal with one shot and have a clean uh, take, I feel is, is very satisfactory and, and, it, and it's a real challenge. Not only a challenge, but in some ways a tribute to the original mountain men, bold adventurers who managed to carve a life for themselves out of an uncharted wilderness. And what would Jim Bridger think if he could see all of this? He'd think he was probably crazy. <laughs> He had to do it for, you know, for real, and why would we want to try to do it for play? Uh, at least one thing he ought to know is that he did make an impression in history. Him and the other mountain men, Meek and Cole Terms, a whole lot of them. In the early 1800s, the knife was the preferred sidearm. It was more efficient by far than the muzzle-loading pistols of the day. And perhaps the most famous was the blade designed by the legendary frontiersman Jim Bowie, a knife that's still a favorite today. It's one of the few knives that I've made that everybody has liked. I've never made a change on it in three years, because every time somebody picks it up, they just, this fits so good in my hand. Everybody Although the frontier has faded into history, the classic design of the Bowie knife will always be a favorite among collectors. But it's just one of many styles handcrafted here in Dusty Moulton's Boise workshop. I've always liked working with my hands, creating things. When I'm done with the day's work, I can sit back and see what I've accomplished. And it's just something that's just enjoyable to me. And then we get into other, other things, uh, 
Coco Bolo from Mexico. Uh, like most artists, form. Dusty has developed yeah, a distinct whenever, appreciation for the materials of the trade. Uh, he combs guy. the world for exotic yeah. woods and colorful minerals to shape into handles. These will, for the most part, determine the price of the knife. The prices can vary from uh, a, a standard base price knife will have something like a piece of Coco Bolo on it, which is not any extra, and then you can go to optional prices. The uh, sheep horn will add $80 to the price. The Amboina burl will add 50 to the price. Uh, the Mastodon, which is real expensive and hard to get, will run from 170 on up, depending on what I Whether it's a graceful collector's knife, the traditional buoy, or a utilitarian knife for hunting trips, each blade begins like this, as a rectangle of raw steel and we'll lay a, a pattern over it and scribe around the pattern and then we uh, rough saw it on the band saw and profile it out on the grinder and that gives us our, our basic shape and we'll drill the holes for the handles. Dusty is continually dipping the blade into a nearby bucket of water to cool the steel as the knife takes shape. There's always the guys who really want the quality that have worked with it and they, they enjoy it. They like having something there that they can take out and then skin out an elk or two and not worry about it getting dull in the middle of the job. And, and that just take pride in having something nice, something they can hand down to their children and their children. And it'll keep its value. Even if somebody even you know, beats one up, gets a little rough, we can recondition it and make it look like new. And it's just something to take pride in. Dusty marks the steel along the leading edge. This will be a guideline for him to follow as he begins the process of sharpening the blade. Because all the grinding is done strictly freehand with no jigs, so I have to have something to, to watch as I'm grinding. He grinds the steel working with progressively finer sanding belts until he's satisfied with the edge. Okay, now we've got this one finished off. It's getting ready to go to the heat treater. When it comes back from the heat treater, this is what we've got. And from here, we'll go ahead and just clean up the blade, take any grind lines, any waves out of it, and it's ready for the handle. The brown oxidation is a result of the heat treatment. Now, this is a critical step. If it was treated too hot, the blade becomes brittle. Too cool, and the knife is soft and won't hold a sharp edge. It takes Dusty several hours of sanding the blade by hand before it's ready for the finger guard or bolster. This is attached to the blade with pins. Then once the, the bolster is on, your handle material and fit it to the bolster, shove it up tight, epoxy it, and clamp it on and let it uh, set. When we're finished, this is what we've, we've got. It, it's epoxied, it has numerous pins in it to help hold it on. It's rough shaped out, and then we'll take it to the uh, belt grinder and, and rough shape the entire handle on the belt grinder. This knife is a basic hunter with a piece of maple burl for the handle, but the burl figuring won't really show through until it's finished. Just like with the blade, Dusty uses progressively finer sanding belts until he gets to the point where machinery becomes too clumsy. But the, one of the most important things is taking the time to do the finish work by hand to create the real the quality. After an investment of several hours of sanding, finishing, and polishing, Dusty will transform this hunting knife into one that looks like this, another beautiful example of quality craftsmanship. It's nice when you're done to, to look at something and see what you've accomplished for the day and, and then to know that someone's going to buy that and show it to his friends and take pride in it and, and it helps you to, to, to make new friends around the country and that's, that's exciting. But I love these things in pancakes more than anything, more than I love them in, in pies. You know, you really can't call picking huckleberries work. It does take a lot of time, but I'll guarantee you, when you're all done, it's really worth it. All right, here we got buckets here. Sylvia, I guess you get the blue bucket here. Yeah, that's yours. 
Okay, Connie, you get to pick the, mo the yeah, most berries be here. Okay, Wayne, there's a bucket for you. Our berry picking team is clearly motivated as we set up the trail in the forest near Cascade. Our leader, Connie Gall, has promised us a huckleberry pie at the end of the day if we manage to save more huckleberries in our buckets than we slip into our mouths. Not always an easy task. The temptation to cheat is overwhelming, and Connie's <laughs> husband, John, is the first to succumb. An easy target. Just a bit of encouragement from the camera crew, and we catch him in the act. The camera never lies. Is that hard to do, to come up here and just pick them and not eat them? Yeah, it is. I'm, I'm using a lot of self-restraint here. Yeah. Yeah, I had one. You gotta test them. Yeah, see if they're sweet or not. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Obviously, a clear case of entrapment. I, on the other hand, immediately go on the offensive. I readily admit I'm cheating. Uh, it's hard not to. I would say the technique, the proper technique is pick three, eat two. <laughs> oh, I don't eat when I pick. <laughs> That's why I come back with some. <laughs> of course, as all good leaders should, Connie sets an example. There's a fourth member of our berry picking team, Sylvia. She's adept at avoiding the camera. It will remain a mystery whether this is due to an underlying shyness or the telltale evidence of an empty bucket. The actual berry picking technique also varies. John's style is pretty straightforward. I don't have a method. I just, when I see when I pick them. But if you watch closely, you'll see that in truth, he does have a method. Uh, oh, I lost one. It's known as the concentrated technique, a steady rhythm of plunk, 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 where every berry counts. Very little flair, but perhaps a few points for endurance. Style is important. Experienced huckleberry harvester Connie has the right idea. She has observed and learned from wildlife. It's called the grizzly bear technique. You plop yourself right down in the midst of a patch and then go to town. Apparently, though, the bears don't pick them clean. I thought that they did. Now, her method is very similar to the grizzly bears, except for the fact that the bear uses his lips to pick the berries, and Connie tends to use her hands, both hands. The deadly combination of picking technique and berry-eating restraint adds up to the biggest bucket of berries. No contest, Connie wins. Who's got the most? Oh, she does, no question. Uh -uh. See, I have a bigger wow. bucket. I have a bigger bucket. <laughs> yeah, she's a two-handed picker. I saw her technique. She puts the bucket down and picks with two hands. No fair. It may not be fair, but it may get us a taste of huckleberry pie. What do you mean? I got a lot. See, let's see how much we all got together. And a little berry hands. That's pretty good. That'll, be, yeah, let's enough see. For pie. That'll be enough for pie. Yeah. Let's, <laughs> let's, let's make like Betty Crocker. <laughs> <laughs> now, the real work begins. Well, now you have to clean them and get all of the sticks and bugs and all of those good things out that you don't want to eat. You don't want to leave a single berry in there. <laughs> We managed to pick and not eat about four cups of huckleberries in all. But Connie is adding another ingredient, a couple of small apples peeled and chopped. Especially in years when the huckleberries aren't very plentiful, the apple makes it go a little farther. And um, I don't know, I just kind of like the taste that you get from a huckleberry apple pie. The chopped apples and huckleberries are combined in a mixing bowl. Well, I put in a cup of sugar and a fourth of a cup of tapioca and some salt and a little almond extract and then this has to sit for 15 minutes while the berries and apples are doing their magic to the side, Connie prepares her pie crust. Now 
now the final look at all those wonderful hard-earned berries. Okay, now we'll put this mixture in the prepared pie crust. And I like to fill it really full. <laughs> well, we did good. We got plenty of berries. Connie adds some butter to make it even juicier and then brings on the top crust. A few snips with the scissors, followed by some nips and tucks along the edge, and it's looking like we may soon have ourselves a pie. We're going to bake this now for oh, about an hour at 400 degrees. Yep, it's all done. Over Connie's protest, we insist on cutting the pie before it's cooled because we can't wait a moment longer to taste the fruit of our labor. It's so anxious to eat this I am. that we just can't wait for it to get cool. And it really doesn't taste any different. Mm. Mm. I'm not kidding. That's really good. <laughs> that is really good. That's really good. I'll wait now for you. <laughs> Thanks for joining us. We'll close tonight with a look at next month's show, when Incredible Idaho takes you on a ride down our state's premier wilderness river, the Middle Fork of the Salmon. Every time I come down, I learn something new, I see something different. This trip, it was uh, a mountain goat where I'd never seen them before, bears that I'd never seen down this low in the canyon. Most people have a real good time, and uh, with very, very few exceptions, uh, appreciate this river and what it means to all of us, whether they're from Idaho or not.